Hello everyone, John Pollock here alongside Robin Black. We're here at the Pepsi Colise in Quebec City where Wednesday night the Tough Nations finale will go down and we just saw the weigh-ins. Robin, uh, no shortage of drama here at the weigh-ins. Let's start off with the main event, uh, both men making weight, Michael Bisping and Tim Kennedy ahead of their five-round middleweight bout that will headline Wednesday night's card. For Michael Bisping, his first time that we've seen him in a year after all of his eye problems here. What kind of problems do you feel that Tim Kennedy presents for a Michael Bisping? You know, it's interesting. I think Tim Kennedy was trying to get inside his head in the weeks and the month and a half leading up to this. Michael Bisping strolled up to him. He didn't push him, didn't shove him. He just had a few words with me. Basically reminded him, hey man, you can do all this talking all you want, but tomorrow night you actually have to fight me. And you could kind of see that was the exchange going on. Kennedy's a heavy hitter, super explosive, especially in the first round. He's really athletic, but nothing Michael Bisping hasn't seen before. So for Kennedy to do well, he has to do well early and he has to have a great night. Obviously, the middleweight division, since the shakeup with Chris Weidman winning the championship, it's so wide open right now, so many different contenders emerging that I think that this is a fight that uh, for both guys to stay afloat in that division, at least in that top end conversation, in that top 10 picture, I think a win's very important here for both guys. Yeah, I think so. And I mean, you know, it's one of those things, man. If you're a prize fighter, you got to win all your fights. But sometimes you just get that sense that this one is going to be more valuable to the, uh, than, you know, your typical fight. And the thing for Kennedy is he raised the stakes, the pressure stakes. He did it himself. We've seen guys do that before. When Ellenberger was facing Rory, he kind of did a lot of trash talk. And when that happens, it adds pressure. Kennedy handles pressure really well. He's a veteran, uh, a military veteran, but uh, it's going to be interesting. I'm really excited about this fight now. Obviously, a lot of the French fighters getting great reactions here at the weigh-ins. Patrick Cote, who is the captain of Team Canada, coaching the team on the series. He will take on Kyle Noak. The last couple of fights with Patrick Cote since coming back, we saw him against Kung Lee, and then Alessio Sakara, and as well his most recent fight with Bobby Volker. I mean, that was a very controversial decision that Cote ended up walking yeah. away with. Kyle Noak, we haven't seen for a long time either. This is a very difficult fight, I think, to break down in terms of a very important fight for both men, I think, right now in their careers. Yeah, I think you're right. And for Pat dropping down to 170, now he's settled into that weight a little bit. That might really work out for him. Where against Volker, he looked a still a little bit shaky. Pat also kind of has that Sam Stout kind of vibe. He's very popular. He can have a great night. Even when he has, you know, not his best nights, he's still a solid, bankable performer. But for a guy like Pat, at this stage of his career, he really needs a big win. Over to the finals of, for the welterweight and the middleweight contracts, Elias Theodoro, he will take on Sheldon Westcott, while on the other side we have Chad LaPriese, who will take on Olivier Aubon Mercier. Who do you feel will be the two men walking away with contracts? I know for one, you're a little biased, yeah. but uh, at least for Chad LaPriese, Olivier Aubon Mercier, this seems to be the final uh, most are very, very intrigued by. Yeah, and anybody around LaPriese seems to be really, really confident right now. For Aubin Mercier, he doesn't have as much experience, but he's still super experienced and he's really, really good if he gets your back. The thing is, if, if his game is to get to your back and take you down, Laprise has had a lot of time to prepare for that. He's a heavy hitter. You see Chad Laprise with this enormous cross around his neck, called the disciple, speaking to God. I mean, he believes. He's not subtle. He's not subtle. He believes, and belief is a very powerful thing. So I'm leaning towards Chad, but I mean, this fight can definitely go either way. And then with Elias, it's really interesting. I work closely with him. I have a business and relationship and a close friendship with Elias, and it really changes your perspective of these weigh-ins when there's somebody that that you care about that much you know instead of being analytical about it all I found myself doing was thinking about my buddy up there so you realize how important this is to fighters to their corners to their friends to their training partners everybody around them uh, the most dramatic I think of the stare downs uh, Dustin Poirier and Akira Khorasani it was Khorasani who states that he was throwing a bunch of names and he chose to fight Dustin Poirier He's certainly an underdog going into this fight they got into a bit of a shoving match and had to be separated uh, this to me the biggest fight of Akira Khorasani's career against someone in Dustin Poirier, who certainly has huge momentum going into this fight. Yeah, I was sitting beside a friend from the office and we're looking at each other just like, you just don't want to mess with Dustin Poirier. Like, you really don't want to look over and that's the guy you have to fight. He's got that kind of aura to him. He's really good everywhere. He's really aggressive. He's mentally really good. For uh, Akira Khorasani, this is a great opportunity and you don't, you know, turn down opportunities, but it's a big hill to climb. He's got to get after it early. He's got to really be aggressive in that first round. He's got to roll the dice a little bit early in the fight. 
We also, a bit, a bit of an interesting uh, change to the Sam Stout fight uh, where he is taking on KJ Nunes. They were contracted to fight at 155 pounds. Both guys got here earlier in the week and they said, hey, we're both around 170. What if we just weigh in and fight at welterweight? UFC gave him the okay. And these guys, you have to imagine not having as strenuous a weight cut. They're going to feel a lot healthier going into the cage. And I think they might be on to something yeah. here for some of these fighters that would love to fight closer to their walk around weight than going through that arduous weight cut the week of. I think without question, this is the biggest story of the weigh-ins here, is that two really smart veterans who can be counted on to always perform looked at each other and were like, how much you weigh? 173. How about you? 172. Why don't we just not go through all this nonsense of making 155 pounds, getting tired, physically draining ourselves. Let's go in at 170 and uh, really put on a show. If this works out, if they're able to have an amazing performance, which we expect from these guys, they they may kind of convince the UFC that when guys are outside of that top 10, top 15, when it sort of doesn't matter to the standings, why not let them, you know, have these kind of either catch weight bouts or go up a division? It makes a lot of sense. It could open the floodgates for anybody outside of the top 20 to not want to go through the weight cut. But you know what? From a fighter's perspective, that to me makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And another interesting trivia note is that Wednesday night, Nordin Taleb will fight here at the Pepsi Coliseum. And then immediately after this, we're going to see his fight to try and get to the house of Tough 19. So he will technically be fighting on television twice in one night. <laughs> yeah, and somehow time traveling after he's fighting here to some other location that happened a while ago. It is really interesting. That's the magic of television. I mean, he is a guy who, Nordin, who is really in amazing shape. He's mentally really good. He had a Bellator opportunity. He's had two Ultimate Fighter opportunities. Fight guy, Network he, blogger, let's he, not forget. Fight Network blogger. The guy's time is right now. Well, if he could have any more momentum, I really couldn't name it outside of writing for Fightnetwork.com. For Robin Black, I'm John Pollock from Quebec City.